Welcome to Quok Talk. I'm Crystal here with my two very special guests that I had the privilege of meeting up in the mountains in Ulsan, Korea, uh, where we were all part of this uh, Korean um, international, what was it called? Ulsan International Mountain Film Festival. Is that right? So I have yeah. here Oswald and Bartek, and I will allow you to do the honors of telling a little bit about yourself so that I can kind of start unpacking the interesting film that you made together um, on the mountains and the experiences you've had. And I have many questions about life, but let's start with you introducing yourselves first. Hello, so I'll, uh, I'll allow Bartek to go first because he speaks life. less. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Bartek and I love skiing. That's it? Yes, he's quite You drunk. get this every time also when you go everywhere. It's like, okay. Yeah, it's always like this. But okay, I'll I'll say more about me and maybe Bartek will come with a couple of words more. So hello, my name is Oswald Rodrigo Pereira. Uh, I'm half Portuguese, half Polish. So let's say my Polish part of my brain decided that I like mountains. And five years ago, I decided to to go as a as a TV reporter for an expedition to K2 in winter. And since then, I started uh, producing and preparing either small, short documentaries or, or longer documentaries about things that happen in the mountains. But what I really try to observe are um, the intentions and emotions that uh, sometimes are away just uh, when faced with the highest peaks on Earth. Because what we see there is so extreme that I think you can see another level of uh, level of uh, humanity, of emotions, of uh, of living. I wonder if it's the deeper, more honest way of seeing um, human emotions, because you're faced with situations that are literally life and death choices sometimes. And when you see how it, it things play out or how people react to certain situations, I, I can't think of a more metaphoric way than to use a mountain as a you know launching pad for talking about humanity so um yeah let's okay so that that's think, really interesting yeah i think it's uh, quite a tough um i would say mission because uh there are moments that i prefer to switch off the camera i had situations like seeing someone close to me dying or someone being dying for like one hour and a half in front of me and maybe some filmmakers would film it because it would make like a potential image that would be like really important for the for, for the film but for me it was more important to think about the family of this person and think that uh, and also respect and basically you are trying to help this person and even when, when you know that you will not call this person anymore i never thought about switching on the camera because i felt like is more important than any climb, than any film. So as as I said, it's sometimes you are in very sensitive situations. And I think it's always like the most important is to be, just keep your values and, and be a human person, not just a climber or a filmmaker. And on the other hand, sometimes you see emotions or like quite deep situations where people are exposed and it's always a thin balance because maybe sometimes you will show a little too much and you will, you will hurt the protagonist. Uh, I'm not saying this in case of Bartek, but also in case of other films that I did. So it's always a thin line. And I think I still try to keep this balance. Maybe at some point I will be already used to so many extreme situations that I will not care anymore. Mm. But for now I still try to to keep this, you know, human human vision that not everything that happens there probably would be very attractive to be shown. But then I think it's not a reality show. Uh, you don't want to show like all the dark sides and destroy someone just because you want to make a, a good film. You you bring up a lot of points there. Um I'm trying to process it right now, but the idea of the politics of framing of what you show or what you decide not to show in a film that could, like you say, expose um, certain elements that maybe some people don't want to see or you don't want to share. Um, but I'm wondering if it comes down to your innate values to begin with of what your fundamental core issues are in, in how you interact with people, right? Um, can I just go back a little bit to talk about like, 
the title of your film even, the, the Silent Escape. I'm thinking about silence and I'm thinking both of you, you were on a two-man expedition for, what was it, 50 days, more than 50 days up there? Just the two of you, right? More or less. 50 days, yes. Yeah, so I mean, obviously you have encountered people, but to have the isolation of being with just one person on such an, uh, you know, such a such a dramatic backdrop with um, very limited uh, resources, what does silence mean to you? Like, how do you what what is the silence in the mountains? What do you hear in in the nights? And how does that kind of silence affect you as a person? Like, do you? Would you go crazy or is it a beautiful thing that you take in as a meditative, you know, or to what extent does it change? The silence turn into something disturbing. I wouldn't always call that a silence. It's adventure in mountains, but uh, just in a remote place. And yeah, switching off internet for a month and literally doing it because you can't really turn it on. It's something special nowadays, I would say. Like for me, at least, because normally I'm every day at work. So there I can just completely get out of it. And yeah, that's valuable for me. Yeah. So it's power in a sense. Yeah, maybe you could call it. Beauty. And staying, yeah, staying with just one person, I think less people, even better and easier to actually, you know, like we met on a big expedition and staying with more people in the base camp is much much more difficult yeah i would say it's it's a uh, it's a luxury <laughs> uh, to be disconnected from civilization and i don't want to sound rude but sometimes it's even good to have some break from your friends maybe family if someone has one but most of all is like of these like speed that you have every day and i don't know if you can recall the last time you didn't have internet for Mm. I don't know, 40, 30 days. Because for people, it's even hard to imagine that after a month, you don't even have Spotify. So even in terms of music that you can listen to, yeah. you have silence on your phone. Because Spotify, after one month, uh, even the sounds that, even the music, the tracks that you downloaded, they are offline. So you cannot listen to music anymore. So even on this matter, it's a it's a silence there. So I would say... From one hand, what Bartek said, and when he says a sentence at the beginning of the film that the, the main goal was to run away from civilization and the internet, of course, uh, it's, I would say, the most important goal was to climb and ski down. But me and meanwhile, you can understand in the film that we are happy being there, that we are happy having each other. And of course, after some point, maybe there there can be some frictions or people will, you know, argue or discuss. In our case, it didn't happen. Actually, we were more tired when we met probably other people because mm. then you you are already in your comfort silence zone. You like interact with each other and suddenly you meet new people. We spent, when there is bad weather, we spent like 10 days in base camp. We didn't have anything to read because our uh, digital books broke. Huh? So basically we were there, we were forced to forced to talk <laughs> that was painful yeah, i'm not saying they are i'm not saying they are but people but you didn't choose them they just decided to go on an expedition and yeah, yeah. suddenly you you share your intimacy with them if uh, you are sick if you feel bad if uh your head uh, i don't know you have some problem with your head and then you need to spend time so you start opening with these people and suddenly you have like very deep conversations with people that you never seen before and probably some of them you'll never see them again yeah. so it's quite unique but yeah so i would say from one side it's like this escape from civilization this peace this yeah. silence and also i would say in the mountains you dive somehow at least me because maybe i see things differently than Bartek. that i think i dive deeper into myself even the 10 days that you have to spend in base camp doing nothing it's a uh, it's a tough uh tough experience but i think it teaches you like a lot about you yeah yeah and and then many people don't want to find a deeper self because it's uncomfortable sometimes it's hard to do and you think and thinking about silence um a lot of people have they can't uh handle awkward silences like even a moment of quietness people make a laughter or a joke because we're so used to all this stimulation that we don't know how to treat silence yeah 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 
So you're saying that there is something that we need to kind of go beyond in order to find that that deeper truth or that op- open up that that more pure space for us to kind of, you know, search for things. Um, can I, you know, I also remember con- conversing with both of you back in Korea. Um, what struck me and my big takeaway from this mountain film festival was that the idea of our approach to the mountains, not to generalize, but is very different in the so-called Western approach in terms of conquering the mountain, the goal of to achieve the top, as opposed to the Asian way, if you will, of a more philosophical approach of the relationship or respect for the mountain. How do you both feel about that? Is it about is it about getting to the top? Uh, I think probably it's again different for us because, uh, like Bartek said, it's an adventure for him, some sort of like spending free time. For me, I think it's a bigger, I take it as a challenge. I'm not sure if uh, I think about the mountains in a philosophical way, but probably it's some internal trip as well. I mean, when I'm at the expedition, I really, I become more quiet, peaceful. I return with, with a different mindset. So I would say in my case, it's a combination of both like the sport side, because of course you are there because you want to climb the mountain. That's why you went there. But on the other hand, I said, I would say this time that you spend with yourself, with another person, the partnership you create, the bond means that you return home changed. And I think for the better, and it doesn't mean that you are a better person, but you are more self-confident and you know more about yourself. Do you change so every time you come back from the mountain, like each trip? That, that That's for sure. And I, I, I know people that sometimes they go for like a week of this solitude. Uh, I don't know how to call it, like treats that they don't talk for a week or something. Yeah. And I say, well, I don't need that because I've been like so many times in the mountains that you spend so many hours alone yeah. and in extreme situations. But usually you are like really in peace when you climb, you don't think yes. about like the dangers. I think you... You go in some slow motion state of mind yeah. that I, I don't need like meditation at home because mm. I got my it's, goals for, for my life. Your process up the mountain is already very meditative. Is it for you also, Bartek? Is it meditative for you or is it more of a thrill for you? Like, what is it that drives you to do this? And you are, by the way, skiing down the mountain. You are not just climbing down like normal people. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's mostly an adventure for me and a perfect way of spending holidays. Uh, yeah, but besides, of course, it helps to understand how valuable normal things are. So when you come back, normal bed, family, and so on, you enjoy much, much, much more. So it helps in some way, as also said. Yeah, I think we under, well, I think we all know the power of the mountain, but maybe a lot of us aren't willing to do it or until we do it do we know the life-changing powers it has? So for example, my daughter, when she went for a three-month uh, hiking trip around the mountains, she came back and she used to be a dancer and she went straight into a ballet studio and she couldn't handle it. She said she couldn't function with the four walls, with mirrors. She's like, why can't, how do people function looking at themselves and, and being in a constricted space when she had the world, she had like sleeping under the stars, she couldn't go back. And it's interesting, you know, how it transforms you. Yeah, I would say sometimes it's even, I would say for me, when I come back from the expedition in mountains, it's even hard to talk to people because on every expedition, it's different, of course. But after this one, uh, we're like together 50 days. And I think three weeks later, we went on a run, a relay run, 400 kilometers. Uh, the seaside of Poland, and at the end, there was an after party. And there were like, I don't know, 100 people, maybe 200. And a friend of us came to us and said, guys, maybe we should stop talking to each other because we spent already so many days. And I don't know, like somehow instinctively, we're searching for each other in the crowd. Like we are, I don't know, partners or we have a special bond, which yeah. is maybe dangerous. But I would say... Uh, back to to the time after the expedition that you get used to to one person that you share everything with then suddenly when you have 50 persons around you asking you questions like touching your face which is burned by the sun and how are your thoughts by blah 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 how was the expedition and you hear like the same question so many times 
after some point, even me, and I'm a social person, I was like, mm. okay, I would need some holidays and maybe I'd like to go back again and spend like two, three days in the mountains to have like a decompression time. Mm. So yeah, I would say, yeah, you get used to like your, your solitude, just your partner, you and freedom. That, but of course, then you have the practical things like part except you have nice food at home, you have your bed, you can take and a shower and right. change clothes after 50 days, yeah. which is, of course, I mean, civilization has nice things. And I remember when I come back from Manasco in winter, and some days later, it was the birthday of my friend, and I went to a club, and they were like, it was quite a posh club, you know, people were ordering, I don't know, champagne, bottles of vodka, some alcohol, or yeah. whatever, whatever. And I looked at these people and I thought I felt like so distant because I just came back from a from a village, Samagun, and there was a woman that was uh, about to give birth. Ah. And of course, she couldn't afford to fly with the helicopter to Kathmandu. So all the village like gathered money to to make her fly. But before she made it to, to, to Kathmandu, she already gave birth somewhere there in the helipad. Wow. So I thought about these women and then I saw these people, you know, in the club like having fun. Yeah. And I felt somehow disconnected. But then I thought to myself, okay, but the other, I would say civilization or culture in, in the small village, it's neither mine. I mean I don't belong there. Mm. But I also felt that I, I neither I don't belong to the place where people have mm. already, you know, their, right. a luxury life and they can think about like how they dress to go out or something. And there there was this woman giving birth. So I would say the time after the expedition is always like this this time that I feel like between two two worlds. Yeah, and it also seems like there are things that happen, you have these encounters that force you or maybe naturally allow you to reassess what's important in life. But, you know, back to your point about the woman giving birth, I was thinking, do you think that it's really, is, is there a gendered space on the mountain? Do you think that women... Um, have to endure different types of challenges up the mountain do you think it's equal do you think that you know we have to think of it in different ways um, yeah i um i think that first of all physically so that's a physical challenge right and of course here there are natural differences and we have the same actually rules right we climb the mountain and that's it so in this regard because you as women have, you know, much, much bigger challenge to, to face. Yeah, I would say uh, there was once a, a test, uh, a survey, and they compared like women that decided to start in an ultra marathon and men. And for men, usually it was like a bet on New Year's Eve, oh, I'm going to marathon or uh, run a half marathon or ultra marathon. And they compared the there was a bigger percentage of women that decided to take part in an ultra marathon that finished the race. Mm -hmm. So you could say that usually for male, it's easier to decide to, you know, jump into deep water, but they don't accomplish. So this shows that women, when they decide for something, I think the mental is somehow stronger. But as Bartek said, like if we think about like physics and natural like capacity, of course, I would say, I mean, not, not climbing, because I think in rock climbing, the difference is, is smoother. But in Himalayas, we're basically on our style of expedition. What does it mean? It means carrying a heavy backpack, spending a lot of hours, not even climbing sometimes, but walking in deep snow, yeah. and then setting a tent, like being under adverse conditions of weather and everything so i would say in terms of body like men have better uh, better That's solutions right. they are better prepared for this yeah. but i would say it, it depends on every individual because uh, yeah i mean there are women stronger than men but i would say in general also like the physiology of women and etc uh, also, I'd say maybe sometimes the intimacy, like you don't have that much, you know, hygienic possibilities yes, of exactly. like taking care of yourself. So I would say in these terms, it's a much bigger challenge uh, mm -hmm. for, for women, not mentally, but in terms of things that you cannot train for. 
Right. Yeah. I thank you for distinguishing that. Um, I have one more question and I don't know, and this is kind of a big, heavy one, and I don't know how we can end it on time, but try, but you know, the question of ethics, cause I'll never forget that powerful story that you told me, you know, and the reason you're in Spain right now is that you went to do a speech for Carlos, who you actually saved, um, who had a broken leg on your expedition. Right. And it's it, part of in your film. And so you, you went, it wasn't part of your plan and and this came to you and you both decided to go back up there to save him um where you know this was a positive case but in some cases maybe where some people think okay well what are the chances of somebody being saved how do you make these hard life decisions of whether you're going to risk your life for the sake of saving someone else and what does that mean for everyone you know can you talk a little bit about that so maybe I'll start and I had already a situation in my life when I crossed like the line of what's safe for me and I was angry at myself that I decided to stay and help someone. But this time it wasn't the case. When we made the decision, when we made the decision, first of all, it was obvious for us that if we can help, we'll go. But also we never thought that we were risking our life. We're just thinking we are helping someone. Of course, uh, just in short words, when you are like in a nice hotel, you had your breakfast, shower after 50 days of expedition, and you're in your comfort zone, and suddenly you are launched again, and you see the base camp, and then suddenly you are on camp two on the mountain that you were like, it's done, I can go home. It's a, it's a, it's a strange experience, but I think we never hesitated a minute. And I think when we talk about partnership and us like working well together, it's also important not, you know, to have like the climbing speed or something. It's the values that will decide about the life and the values will decide about our partnership. So yeah, we, we never fought for a while. And even when we were greeted here in Spain by his family and his friends and they like stood up and gave us like an ovation applause and we we felt like really humble but we're like that's not necessary like we, we did what's what should be normal like don't call us like superman or something because we'd like everyone to be like this and we are not saying this you know because it's just words we just think that it should be normal for everyone uh i it's mean not. everywhere Unfortunately, it's not. Some people are thinking, well, I have this mission I trained so hard for to get to the mountain. Nothing's going to come in my way. Or, you know, they think other ways that just resituate. Yeah, but we, even when we were going to the to speech, we spoke with the interpreter and she, she asked us, like, do you think people stop when they see an accident to help people or they take pictures of the accident? I was like, yeah, I think usually most of the people, if you think of them, they would just pass, you know, slow down for a while, provoke another accident but they wouldn't stop to ask if everything was, is okay because they always think, ah, oh, someone will take care of it better than me. And maybe that's the truth. But here in this case, we just thought if we can be useful, of course, we are going there. And at the end, well, the, the situation was quite tough and we're quite useful to, to the rescue operation of, of Carlos. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it's not. It's, it's a sad thing, uh, but well... We'll try to keep our values as as long as possible. And I think what we have in the climbing spirit, what I have in my film ethics and etc. If we would just say this and then had the situation like with the rescue operation with Carlos and we wouldn't move a finger, this would be empty words. So I think this like shows that when we talk about this, we really believe in these values and these comportments. Yeah, yeah. And you can't train for that it, it's it's your innate value i think and you've seen a lot on on i think the the mountain again revealing the, the real human nature of different types of people um i think remember you also once mentioning that um there's a sadistic side to some people who are attached themselves to the mountains for the reasons for maybe being closer to death i don't know i'm not trying to um distort but can you tell a little bit about that mental space of that attraction well, uh, yeah, there was this, uh, I mean, uh, some scientific research by a, a university from Canada that basically people that went out from trauma, uh, like develop a better like preparation for extreme sports. And in this case, it was compared to, to mountains. And yeah, so I would say 
when you come from like tough situations, sometimes you think like nothing worse will happen in my life. So when you are in the mountains and you are freezing, climbing, and you are tired, but then you think, yeah, but I'm doing this for myself. I paid to be here, like big amount of money because I needed to buy a permit and everything. So you think it, it's basically my holidays. No one forced me to, to do this. So I would say whatever, I mean, of course, it depends on the approach of every person. But I would say in my case, whatever I passed, in the past made me stronger and and i think when i have like really crisis i i i go back to some of the tough moments of my life and i just remember like you could be there mm. but you are right now here and you decided and you are a free person and you decided to be here so take some advantage and and enjoy the process even if yeah. it's i don't know minus 30 degrees yeah process indeed and i and unfortunately we're probably out of time to talk so much about your process but leave us with something um bartek you're you're still you know you're a young crazy athlete who does these like you know you know crazy stunts um and you're a ski instructor and you're you know a true alpinist what you know going forward are there things that you want to accomplish in life or is this your process of doing something that you know you just can do now what are your thoughts on life well, I, I would just say I, I want to enjoy life and have fun. And you're doing that? That's it. Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay. But it's good for now. Okay, great. Thank you. And Oswald, what is what is your life mission? I mean, you've been doing so much uh, coming to you. <laughs> I feel there's so well, much. I like, to have, I, I, like, I like to have fun as well, of course, <laughs> like Bartek said. Does he, uh, Bartek, does he want to have fun? But, or is Oswald too, is Oswald too serious? <laughs> no, I'm not serious okay. at all. I just like, okay. I have a couple of sides of my face to show to people. Yeah. Uh, so that's a serious one. But um, I mean, I'm older than Bartek, so I'm, I'm 39 years old. And of course, probably I spent more time on this earth, so I have more time to think. Mm -hmm. And I'm an overthinker, overthinking person. So yeah, I would say, like, I always like to, at first when I was a kid, to read stories of big adventurers, of, like, history of people, story of people. Mm -hmm. Then when I become a TV reporter, it's part, it's like the core of your job, is searching for stories and find a way to tell about them. Then it turned into climbing and filming. So I would say, like, it's a, it's a process, it's a path. And like there is this, this sentence at the beginning of, of the film that if you search for a goal, you'll become empty when you find it. But whoever finds a path will always carry the goal inside. Mm -hmm. So I would say I cannot even say what's my goal because it's somewhere there. It's not a climb. I, I can say what's my goal for next year. It's going again uh, with Bartek to 2,000 years for Bartek to ski down, for me to make a film, most of all, for us to come back alive and be friends. But I would say, like, my life goal, wow, it's still, like, so far away that uh, I cannot even think about this. So for now, I enjoy the path, and I'm happy with myself. I'm in peace with myself, and I would say that's one of the, I think that that's the most important thing in my life. I was asked, like, a month or two months ago <clears throat> by a young club member from our climbing uh, club, yeah. Where do I see myself in 10, 20 years? What I want to accomplish as like math. Yeah. And I think about five years ago, like what happened. And then I think about like, I don't know, my friends that live in Ukraine, how their life changed yeah. in a year and a half, how COVID changed our life. Like at some point, you know, you were yeah. not allowed to travel in the world. Exactly. So I would say, yeah, let's go step by step. Exactly. small goals and and enjoy the path i like that i think that's what we're gonna leave it with enjoy the path i think that's the biggest takeaway i have because you are taking your paths and we all have our own paths and they can be bumpy they can be smooth but they they are our processes and it's so important to enjoy and appreciate that process so thank you for sharing a glimpse of your processes because we learn so much from stories like yours and good luck with your next adventures and your next films I look forward to seeing and um, hope we can see each other again in person in the near future. Thank you very much. It was a, a pleasure to, to meet you in, in South Korea and spend this time with you. And thank you also for your uh, insights about the film and our persons. And thank you. And tell person. people how we can look for your film. 
So uh, for now, the film will be shown um, on a tour, uh, Mountains on Stage. Uh, it will be shown in uh, 20 countries, 250 locations, also uh, apart from Europe, in USA, in Canada and Australia. And so let's say until spring, I'll be just showing this in festivals, but at some later st stage, probably it will be available online because I'd like more people to, to learn oh, we the stories we shared and see how and some and adventurous bar Oh, he just zips <laughs> down so gracefully like it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you again and good luck with your next projects. You both are amazing people.